Good evening, my friends. Welcome to this evening's live stream presentation here on the Tattoo Historian Facebook and YouTube channels. Really appreciate you taking time out of your evening to join us. Tonight we have Dr. Lindsay Shravinsky. Uh, she uh, has a, new, uh, a newer book out. It's been out for a little over a year now, uh, entitled The Cabinet, George Washington and the Creation of an American Institution. Uh, Dr. Lindsay Shravinsky is a historian of early America, the presidency, and the government, especially the president's cabinet. She produces history that speaks to fellow scholars as well as a large public audience. Dr. Shravinsky believes history can be exhilarating, and she works to share her passion with as many people as possible. Her research can be found in publications from op-eds to books, speaking on podcasts and other media and teaching for every kind of audience. As I stated, the cabinet, George Washington, the creation of American institution was released last April in 2020. She also writes a monthly column for governing and is a regular guest on the Thomas Jefferson Hour podcast. Lindsay, thank you so much for being here. I really do appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm, I'm excited. I, I, uh, I spoke to uh, Dr. Shafinsky offline, and uh, I said that I have uh, a color from uh, the the West Parlor, Prussian blue, in here from Mount Vernon. So I'm very excited to get that nerdy about th this evening's color coordination here. Um, I'm known for that, so that's kind of a, a nerdy little thing going on there. Uh, but uh, Lindsay, before we get deep into the weeds of your research and the book and how that came about, a lot of my audience loves to hear about how people like us got into history. So I'd love to start off with asking you, uh, what was the moment you thought that you wanted to be a historian or that you were just excited about the historical narrative? Well, I've, um, I've always loved history. And when I was a kid, I was a voracious reader of historical fiction. And my mom had a rule that every family trip had to have something cultural, whether it was a historic site or a museum, including walking the Freedom Trail in Boston in March in the snow in shorts, because we were from California and had apparently not realized that it was still going to be winter. So uh, that was, I think, very much a part of who I was, but I actually didn't decide until I was older, I was going to be a lawyer. I applied to law school, I got into law school, and then at the last minute was like, mm, I don't think I want to do that. <laughs> um, and that was a really good choice because I would have been miserable. Um, but I've just always loved it. And in particular, trying to envision how people lived lives in moments and places and times that feel so different than our own. And what is similar? So, you know, people have hopes and wishes and fears and dreams and sickness and, you know, they're tired and uh, love and passion, but also they didn't have electricity. So, like, you know, how does that change what life feels like? So I've always been fascinated by that. And when I started getting more serious about my work, I really like studying how people use power, how they have it, how they use it, what kind of imprint they can leave on history. And that's kind of my driving question um, with all of my scholarship is how do people use power and uh, change change the world? Hmm. Did you uh, want to go into uh, early American history when you went to university or did you decide to go a different route with the with history in general? Well, I've always had a couple of passions. So sort of my, my you know, guilty historical passion is Tudor England. And um, mm. so I when I when I want to learn about history, but I don't want it to be related to my work at all. Mm -hmm. That is the type of work that I read because I can sort of disentangle my brain. Um, I'm also a sucker for, you know, Civil War history and actually recently have been on a bit of a World War One, World War Two kick. Um, but early America was always it for me. And I think that I just was so fascinated by the start of the nation. How, how does one do that? How does one start a country and then survive? And that question is one that obviously there have been a trillion answers to, and I've done my best to answer as well, but I don't think I will ever really stop wanting to explore how that came to be. Yeah. That's the, that's the beauty of history, right? We're, we're constantly curious people and we want to investigate and uh it's it's an amazing thing to go through uh to to become a historian and to actually work as a historian uh, what what was it like going through university for you was it was a pretty uh challenging process for you was it uh you know pretty uh 
I don't want to say easy because that's not going to be easy to get a doctorate. Uh, sure. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> no. I can't do it. Uh, but yeah, yeah we well, I mean, you know, in some ways, um, the fact that I didn't decide that I wanted to be a historian until later is kind of ridiculous mm -hmm. because that those were always the classes that did come easiest. Not mm -hmm. easy. I always worked really hard, but sure. it was the most natural fit. And so when I finally decided on it, it was kind of like, well, duh, why hadn't I thought of that sooner? Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, like I, I told my family and my sister was like, well, obviously you used to try and <laughs> try candlelight when you were a kid to see what that was like, like, course you're going to be a historian. So that really kind of all the pieces fell into place. But graduate school is a very different beast in that you really can't, there's no way to prepare yourself and there's no way to learn how to do it other than to do it. And you can ask a hundred historians how to, you know, gut books and read quickly and write a dissertation and they're going to give you 105 answers. And that's because every single person has a different process. So it was really hard. It's, you know, it's really hard. And I think that you have to be 100% committed that this is what you want to do, or it's going to be a miserable process. And there are going to be, even if you're 100% committed, there are going to be tough moments because it's many, many years and it requires a lot of dedication. And sometimes the work is solitary and it's a lot of delayed gratification. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, maybe you're 25 and your friends are starting to make money. And so they're traveling and doing fun things and you're sitting there making no money and, you know, studying right. all the time and writing all the time. So you really have to delay kind of adulthood in some ways if you go mm -hmm. almost straight through. Um, so I think that for me was sort of the biggest mental hurdle was just knowing that this was the time I had to invest. And then once I was there, I would be okay. Um, but I, I also loved the work. I loved the reading. I loved the research. I loved being able to talk. I mean, your job is to read books and to talk about them. So while it is hard, it is an extraordinary thing. Um, the one thing I would say is if people aren't sure, get a master's first and see how it goes. Don't dive headfirst into the PhD if you aren't totally certain, because that's a little brutal. Yeah, I actually spoke with uh, a young student who's in high school the other day, and uh, obviously they're not in now summer, but they were saying, you know, next year's my senior year, I'm thinking about becoming a historian. I was like, oh, great, you know, just take that vow of poverty and, and you'll be fine. And <laughs> we'll and, uh, and he said, uh, my only problem is I don't like to read. And I'm like, oh, you're, you're not going to, you better pick something <laughs> else if, if that's the case. So, uh, but I, I think because of the pandemic, I think we're so used to having everything digitized online or, or a lot of things digitized online that, he believed that was the way it was going to stay. And I'm like, uh, archives are going to be opening up. You better yeah. get used to reading. <laughs> well, and there are certain, there are certain fields that you can kind of get away with doing more digitization because of what, whether the time period or what type of record it is mm -hmm. um, that provides more opportunities. I mean, even in my own work, I've gotten a little spoiled because all of the records uh, on founders online and the national archives and then the papers projects are all digitized. And so that now there, there are challenges with that because instead of dealing with like 50 letters, I'm dealing with 50,000 letters. So there's, you know, unique challenges in that way. But sometimes when I have to return to microfilm, I'm like, oh, I have to, <laughs> why can't it be online? Yeah. So, you know, it's, I think there's a, there's a, a flip side to that coin. Yeah. When did uh, political history start to uh, become a thing for you? When did that really start to peak? Always. Um, always. It, was, it was always, if I was going to be a historian, that was what it was going to be. I just, I have this fascination with people who have power. So I think, you know, that kind of comes into play when we're talking about world wars and when we're talking about the, you know, tutors and that kind of thing. It's people who have power. And what does that do to your psyche? How do you manage those things? But also, you know, how do people leave the biggest thumbprint on the history books? And I would argue, at least in the United States, that mm -hmm. I think people had the biggest opportunity to make an impact in the early Republic when they were forming this government, because there were so few people in office. So, you know, we're really talking about like, you know, dead mm -hmm. people and um, they were starting from scratch. And so they had this ability to craft something from the beginning and that it was a tremendous responsibility and huge power. So I think that's really kind of where 
my fascination, my fascination comes from. And it's always kind of been there though. You know, it's, it, that was always, I've liked reading about other things, but it's always come back to power. Hmm. When you began work on the, on the book, the cabinet, um, how did you go through the research process for that? Where did you find uh, the primary sources and, and how did you locate them? Well, it was a little bit of a topsy-turvy process because I thought for sure there had been books on the cabinet. And so I was hoping to provide something new. And after realizing that there really hadn't been any books on the cabinet, right. the, the last publication was in 1912 by Henry Barrett Learned. And it was about right. the... Um, legislation that created each executive department. Uh, when I realized that, I, you know, then spent the next eight years hoping no one would beat me to it. But, um, you know, most people start with a book that's sort of related to what they want, and they mine those sources, and then they go from there. And I didn't really have that. There are, there are t there's tons of literature on Hamilton and Jefferson and Washington, but there's not really anything on the institution. So that's where I had to start. I started by learning about the people involved and understanding the narrative arc of the story. I think that's always a really good place to begin. And the best way to do that is to read the existing work and scholarship that's already out there. And that will obviously give you a sense of the sources they use, which is a really good starting place. And I very quickly realized that there are these presidential papers projects um, or you know, some, some founders as well. So George Washington, James Madison, Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton, Benjamin Franklin, now John Jay has been added. And they give you a phenomenal, just unbelievable repository um, mm. through which to work. And so I basically started going through them and reading them and finding anything that was related to cabinet conversations. You can't, I mean, word searches are a great place to start. And I absolutely mm. did word searches, but you can't just rely on that. Right. And here's a great example of why. Washington refused to use the word cabinet during his presidency. Um, everyone else was using it. Everyone understood that's what it was. And he was very quick to use it once he retired. Mm. But he refused to call his cabinet a cabinet. So if you search for cabinet in his letters, you're not going to find anything. Wow. Um, so I think that, you know, I really started there with the letters and then started sort of cross purposing, cro you know, cross searching. So if Hamilton mentioned something, what did Jefferson have to say about it? and vice versa. And then also, was there anything in the newspapers? And what other resources can I find? And then really went from there. And one of the parts that I think people don't really tell you about writing a book, at least for me, mm. you can research every question you can possibly think to ask. And then you sit down and you start writing and you will realize there are things that you didn't think to look up. Like what was the weather on any particular day? Or what did this room look like? Or, you know, where was the address of this thing? And so to a certain extent, there has to be some overlap between research and writing. Mm -hmm. uh, before we get into Washington's cabinet itself, we have to look at Washington previously and, and the men that are going to be in the cabinet previously. And you do an awesome job with that in the book where uh, you, you go through each person individually and then bring them together as a collective, which is just awesome because it's almost like they have their own individual biography within the book and then you see them come together in these different forms uh for you when you started to research washington uh and and him taking command of what would become uh the army at, outside boston uh what was that like for you from seeing him from a leadership standpoint since you're uh, so into leaders and leadership standards from history what was that like sure. for you to see Washington in that way? Yeah, well, this actually was one of my favorite sort of inadvertent discoveries, which is that I didn't initially set out to write a Washington book. I set out mm. to explain where the cabinet came from. Mm -hmm. And because there's no legislation and it's not in the Constitution and the British cabinet and the councils of state and the state governments were very much anti-origins, which we can discuss, mm -hmm. I then had to look of, okay, where did it come from? And, you know, why, why did this happen in this way? And it became a, a Washington story because it was very much his personal creation. And I firmly believe that we cannot treat Washington as Washington, the general and Washington, the president, because like all humans, he was influenced by what came before and what experiences he had. And so I started looking into those things and what I discovered as I was looking through the councils of war minutes and the cabinet notes 
just the incredible parallels between Mm -hmm. how he organized a meeting, how he convened his advisors, what sort of strategies did he use to manage these unbelievably big personalities and, you know, touchy egos? How did he like to converse? How did he like to make a decision? And while I certainly saw his flaws because his temper comes out in these conversations sometimes and he's very thin skinned and he gets fussy and all that, what I came away with was this incredible appreciation of a willingness to show up without necessarily a decision made. He, he genuinely showed up to these meetings to ask for advice and input from people who had knowledge and expertise that was different than his own. And that takes a pretty big person to say, I don't know, can you please help me? And then to take that information, study it and make a decision. And that's basically what he did with the councils of war and the cabinets. And um, that was, I think that gave me a better appreciation for who he was as a leader, because as we know, that is not something that sometimes people in power are capable of doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I was so um, surprised by his leadership at Boston with the councils because he would go to the council and he would say, I want to attack. And they're like, no, in layman's terms, no, I don't think that's a good idea general. (laughs) And he would listen to them. And he, he was, he wasn't one to say, well, I'm in command. We're going to do what I say. He listened to the council and he was like, yeah, okay, we'll wait. And then when they take Boston, they see that, yeah, that would have been a death trap. So he, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and I think, you know, one of the things that's so interesting is that councils of war were practice that were inherited from the British Army. However, each commander could really put their own stamp on it. And so I looked in the book, I look at General Cornwallis, some of the councils that he had and sort of the character of those meetings. And that was a very different vibe. He went in and said, this is what we're going to do and expected the officers to agree with him. So you're right. It it didn't necessarily have to go that way. And, you know, partly that was Washington had an had an initial understanding that he needed his council's agreement. He thought that that's what Congress had asked him to do. Um, But the fact that he thought that and was willing to play along with that and to try and get them on his side and find compromise and a middle ground that they could all agree upon was pretty remarkable and something he continued to do, even when it was clear he didn't have to get their agreement. He still tried to sort of build consensus among the officers whenever possible. Yeah, it almost seemed like he knew he was in a precarious situation leadership wise, and he knew that all of them had to strike at one time to be relevant while Cornwallis and everyone else could just, you know, uh, go about doing their thing because they know they have everyone behind them. Uh, So many people could leave the Continental Army on a whim. Uh, It seemed like Washington realized that yeah, I better have everybody in agreement with this and listen to my counsel with it. Um, who uh, I'm a big Knox guy. I'm a big Henry Knox fan, and uh, Henry Knox I think is overlooked a little a little too much. Uh, but he's there. He's there all through the war and is actually part of the cabinet. Uh, with Knox, what was what was he like as an advisor, not only as a soldier but as in civilian life? What was he like for Washington? I'm really glad you asked, because one of the reasons that I did include these mini bios at the beginning was because I felt that it was really important to push back on the Hamilton Jefferson narrative. So often we think of the cabinet and we just think of those two. And there's good reason. I mean, they were obviously very influential and important figures, but they were not the only important figures. (laughs) And Knox gets overshadowed for two reasons. First, when he left, Washington was pretty displeased with his last few months in office and their relationship soured after he left office. Hmm. Second, Jefferson had the last word and left records for us to sort of think about Knox's contribution. And I really see myself (laughs) as sort of pushing back against Jefferson. And here's why. So Jefferson frequently wrote in his notes that Knox was basically Hamilton's toady and just went along with whatever Hamilton wanted to do. Well, Knox was in the army for eight years and he served for eight years. And then he served as the commander of West Point. And then he served as the acting or as the secretary of war and then the acting secretary of war and then the secretary of war. So maybe just maybe the experiences that led Hamilton to believe that a strong federal government was essential and a strong executive was essential. 
Knox also shared because he had like three times the same experience as Hamilton did. And in fact, had been at higher levels of authority during those experiences. So it's possible that one of the reasons he agreed with Hamilton was because he had seen the inability of Congress firsthand to get anything done. Um, and Washington certainly felt that he was someone worth consulting. And the first couple of years he was in office, he was really central to the cabinet because one of the big issues on Washington's agenda was relationship with Native Americans. And that was under the purview of the Secretary of War, as well as the reorganization of the militia and the army was sent out to several different battles. So he was really central to the cabinet affairs. And if we need any additional reason to take him seriously or to you know pay attention into his contributions when he went to Maine in the fall of 1794 to deal with some personal business. Washington pleaded with him to come back and said, I, you know, I, I desperately want you to come back so that you are here when we're dealing with the Whiskey Rebellion. Mm -hmm. And if he wasn't important and wasn't valued, Washington wouldn't have cared that he was gone. Mm. Yeah. I, I don't know why he's, well, I guess you said it where Jefferson had the last word and kind of Knox gets kind of pushed to the side and we see him as a revolutionary war figure. And then in many places, he just disappears mm -hmm. and, don't, and they don't see him at the first cabinet meeting and, and advisory work and stuff. And that's really great that you touched upon that, obviously because he's part of the story, but I think you're absolutely right where uh, someone else had the last word about him for far too long and yeah. got shoved under the rug. Uh, one person that a lot of people probably uh, haven't heard much about uh, is is Edmund Randolph. And I'm, I'm sure some of my followers maybe never heard a lot about him. I didn't hear, I never heard a lot about him until I read your book. Who was Edmund Randolph in this story of early America and the, in the first cabinet? Well, Edmund Randolph was really similar to Knox in that his uh, departure from the public scene and his the way his relationship with Washington ended and again, Jefferson's word really sort of color our perception of him. So Edmund Randolph was one of Washington's first aides de camp during the revolution. He then went back to Virginia and served as the state attorney general. He served on the state council and he served as governor. He then became the first attorney general. And he also in all of that time was Washington's private lawyer. So he and Washington were incredibly close and he was a brilliant legal mind. He was so well respected for his legal intellect that people like Hamilton and Jefferson, who had both trained as lawyers, often requested his legal counsel on legislation or matters facing the federal government. So he was very much, although he did not have a Department of Justice because that wasn't created until 1870, he was very much an equal player in the cabinet. And if they met and made a decision and he was out of town, Washington would reconvene the cabinet to make sure he agreed. He really takes on additional importance in Washington's second term after Jefferson retired as Secretary of State and Randolph was promoted to be the second Secretary of State. And he was really, I think, Washington's most trusted advisor at that point. Now, things start to get a little fuzzy in 1795 because the Jay Treaty was received in early 1795 and kept secret from almost everyone. Randolph and Washington were one of the few that knew, which kind of shows his mm -hmm. importance. Mm -hmm. And then these letters are obtained. And if you bear with me, this is kind of a convoluted story because the sources are very still sort of dubious. In 1794, when the Whiskey Rebellion happened, as Secretary of State, Edmund Randolph apparently said sort of in passing to the French minister for a sum of money, he could influence the outcome of, you know, American events. Now, what I believe that letter, what he actually said was, you know, if you were to fund the rebels, you could change the outcome of this rebellion. Hmm. So the French minister writes this in a, you know, a regular report back to the government in Paris, that dispatch is sent on a French ship in French, in French, of course, sent on a French ship back to Paris. That ship is captured by a British ship. The British captain gives the letter to the British minister who gives the letter to Timothy Pickering, who is the Secretary of War at the time and a high Federalist, meaning like the most radical Federalist. 
And he doesn't really like Randolph because Randolph has way more influence in the government and is more of Republican leaning. He shares this dispatch with Washington, who does not speak French, so he has to rely on Pickering's translation, which is a bad translation. <laughs> and Pickering basically says that Randolph offered to give state secrets for a bribe. I don't believe that that's actually what happened. Washington confronted Randolph in front of Pickering and Wolcott, and Randolph was so insulted that Washington would think so poorly of him and distrust him in this way, he immediately resigned. And then they exchanged a series of letters and then Randolph publishes the letters, which is the ultimate no-go with Washington. And it becomes this big debacle. Randolph goes back to, he went back to Virginia and became a private lawyer and, you know, was still respected in Virginia society, but never really held public office again. And he and Washington never spoke after he published those letters. Wow. Wow. It's a very dramatic story. <laughs> yeah. There's, you know, if people think there's there's drama in politics today, it's been there since, and not, maybe not to the extent, but it's been there incrementally since day day one, it seems. Absolutely. Uh, and I, you know, if I could go back to any moment and be sort of a fly mm -hmm. on the wall and understand what had actually happened, because obviously we have to rely on documents, I think that would be the moment because I feel like the evidence is so convoluted that I would really love to know what actually happened. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. That's an amazing story. Uh, we've gone over Henry Knox for a moment. We went over Evan Randolph. There's two other uh, men that we have to go over who are, everyone's gonna <laughs> know the names. Uh, but there at the first meeting is uh, Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson. Uh, what was it like to experience Thomas Jefferson through your work uh, with the original documents? Uh, Thomas Jefferson is a tricky character because mm -hmm. he has such a conscientious eye to what he is leaving behind in the historical record. And so um, he was incredibly productive and prolific in his writings, but you kind of have to take them with a bucket of salt because he knew exactly what he was doing and he knew exactly, you know, who he was writing for. So, um, but he also could be incredibly funny. So for example, one of my favorite lines, um, I, have, I have two and, and they both come from him. So at one point he was writing to James Monroe about the cabinet meetings and he said that the votes usually came down to two and a half to one and a half. And that's because Edmund Randolph often flip sides or he, you know, he thought Edmund Randolph was being wishy-washy. Um, and it really just Randolph sometimes didn't agree with him, which Thomas Jefferson couldn't fathom that Randolph wouldn't agree with him. Um, but that's funny. It's, you know, it's a funny line. And his descriptions of Hamilton's rants during the cabinet meetings are priceless, especially when we think about the space that they were in, which was not a big one and um, how frustrating that must have been for Jefferson. Um, but, you know, he's also just a little bit of a difficult, he does not put down his thoughts, all of his thoughts on paper. So he can be a little bit difficult to access. Hmm. So he's, he's very calculating in his story as he's living. He's very yes. calculating on how his legacy is going to be seen later on. Like a lot of, some people are with memoirs. Yes. And he also went back and he did a lot of cult because he lived so long and he lived so long after being in office. He had a lot of time and opportunity to go back and cultivate his papers and pare things down and sort of revise things accordingly. And we also, we of course don't know what people burned. So we don't know what was there and is no longer available to us. And that's true with everyone, but especially because he lived for so long, there was just sort of extra ample opportunity to do that. Has that changed the historical memory of Jefferson in the, in that way? Has has all these as we've going as we've gone through some of the documents uh, over the years, over the last fifty years, hundred years, has the historical memory of Jefferson changed because he was so calculating uh, in that way, or has it been kind of confined? Well, um, our, our memory of him has certainly changed a lot. One of the really interesting things about Hamilton and Jefferson is that when one is popular, the other is inherently not. And that's, you know, partly because of their 
relationship with one another, but it's also because of their sort of diametrically opposed views. And so there have been moments when Jefferson is on the rise and Hamilton is on the fall and vice versa. And they've both been used by both political parties, depending on the moment and what is convenient um, and what arguments make sense. So he's definitely had an up and down. He's on a, a pretty significant downward slope at the moment. Mm. Um, but I don't know that it's necessarily because of his records. I think it's because we as a society like to use history to serve our own ends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what about Hamilton? Hamilton has kind of been on an upswing lately in popular history uh, in the last few years. Yes. Uh, what about what about him as a as a as basically being part of this cabinet and being a counsel to uh, Washington. What is he like in that capacity and what was he like as a person? Well, I think that um, Joanne Freeman said it best, which is that he would have, I mean, I think she said he was a, what did she say? An arrogant, irritating, arrogant, arrogant, irritating swear word. I don't know if I'm allowed to say swear word. Oh, words. you're allowed. This is this is funny. Uh, she called him an asshole on on public television, which is pretty hilarious. Oh, I and remember I when he, that happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, I mean, look, there's no question that he was brilliant. There's no question that he had a work ethic unlike anyone else's and came up with this brilliant financial system. Mm -hmm. Um, and he could be very charming when he wanted to be, but he also would have been a jerk and he would have been really annoying. And if he had Twitter, you would have had to mute him because he would have been nonstop about it. And so there were, you know, those qualities would definitely came through in the cabinet. And there were times when Jefferson wrote that he spoke uninterrupted for 45 minutes in a meeting. And we know that he tended to sort of pace and gesticulate wildly when he was talking. And they were meeting in a very small room and for hours. And he spoke for 45 minutes without stopping and then came back the next day and did the exact same thing. So like he would have been impossible to work with. And yet there were very few people who better understood how to work for Washington and how to write for Washington. He had a real knack for capturing Washington's ideas and the dialogue he wanted to use and putting that to paper. And so he was a very efficient and savvy number two. Mm. Wow. Something that I, I read in your book, uh, on a number of occasions that Washington has to deal with is something that we hear about very often throughout history up until the present day. And that's uh, the presidency and the president uh, against Congress and, and, the, and the butting of heads and not being on the same page. And, and no matter how hard they try, they can't seem to break through. Washington has to deal with this too, correct? On a number of occasions. Yeah, he does. Um, you know, actually, interestingly, uh, in the recent C-SPAN presidential rankings, I think he was ranked number one in his relationship with Congress, which is just, I did not rank him number one when I filled out my ballot. Really? Let me just put it that way. And I did fill out a ballot and he was not number one. Where'd you put him? Um, because he, what, sorry? Where'd you put him? What number? You know, I don't remember where I ended up putting him with that thing. The, so the way that you, as a, as a quick digression here, the way that yeah. you filled out the ballot is there were basically, I think it was like eight to 10 categories. And one of them was relationship with Congress. And you ranked that person's ability from, you know, not efficient at all to very efficient one to 10. Okay. And so I tried really hard to be honest and um, authentic about how I was doing it. So I genuinely tried to fill out each category for how I thought people did as opposed to where I wanted them to be. Mm -hmm. And there were several that you were encouraged if you didn't know, you didn't have to fill it out. So like, I didn't have rankings for everyone because why would I? That would be inappropriate. But Washington, I had rankings for. Right. I think I you know, probably put him sort of in the middle with Congress because there were times that he was incredibly effective and and did get a lot done. And then there were times when he really didn't get along and he was the first to assert executive privilege, which is an inherently contentious thing to do. He was um, uh, very dismissive of the House of Representatives attempts to gain more authority over the diplomatic process and gave them quite a talking to um, in that in that process. And um, actually, so the letter that he wrote on March 31st, 
1796, he asserts executive privilege and lectures them that they are trying to gain authority that's not in the Constitution. And he was at the Constitutional Convention and he was there and he heard the decisions that were made. And if anyone wanted to double check his memory, the records of the convention were in the Department of I think, War Offices. It is an unbelievable letter and such an epic mic drop because he's basically calling their bluff and it works quite well. But anyway, yes, the relationship was incredibly contentious at times and could be very, very critical. Wow. Uh, for everyone watching, remember that in the comments, I did place a link for, for Lindsay's book. Please, please go and order that. Uh, we do have a couple of people who said they've ordered. So thank you so much for doing Thank that. you. Um, what, uh, a couple points on uh, the highs and lows uh, of this whole thing. What would be a, a high point for Washington with his uh, cabinet or slash his uh, time with working with Congress as, as the first president? Sure. Um, so I think probably the, um, the high point with Congress is um, – is is there are a couple of things is early on when they're sort of establishing all of the things that we take for granted today, like inaugural addresses and uh, what we think of as state of the unions and correspondence between the two branches, those things had to be, they have to start somewhere and the constitution doesn't say anything about them. And so there were no directions, there was no guidebook and they kind of had to come up with it. And so he actually worked pretty closely behind the scenes with James Madison, Madison would write his letter to Congress and Congress, and then he would write Congress's letter back to Washington and mm -hmm. with, of course, Washington's assistance. And so they were basically drafting correspondence to each other, mm -hmm. which is a pretty remarkable moment. Um, his high point on the cabinet, I think there, there are probably two. Um, the first is during the neutrality crisis, and that's the the peak of cabinet activity and the cabinet and Washington work very closely to expand and carve out a sphere of influence for the executive over diplomacy and foreign policy mm -hmm. and what that means. And um, that was, that was a contentious and difficult process because it had never been, all of this had never been done before, of course. But so there were just so many legal questions that that went along with that. And, and um, they worked really closely to do so. And the following year, they sort of did the same thing with domestic affairs. So the Whiskey Rebellion was really an opportunity where the cabinet worked hard to expand presidential authority over what happened on the ground. And that was really initially interpreted to be state or congressional jurisdiction. But with cabinet assistance, Washington kind of made it the president's. How about the opposite? What was the low point, you believe? There were probably a few, but uh, where, where I'm sure Washington pounded his fist from time to time. Uh, what do you think is one of the low points that uh, viewers should know about this relationship with the cabinet? So um, I would say the low point with the relationship probably came towards the end when after Randolph resigned, uh, Washington had a series of new appointees and I sort of affectionately refer to them as the B team because they were not, they were not of the same <laughs> quality as the original appointees. And um, so for example, Timothy Pickering had been the secretary of war, was perfectly fine secretary of war, but Washington ended up making him the secretary of state after he asked seven other people and they said no. So not exactly a ringing yeah. endorsement. Yeah. And um Washington regularly complained that James McHenry, who was the new Secretary of War, was basically not up to the demands of office. Mm -hmm. So he really turned away from cabinet meetings because I don't think that he wanted to meet with them. I don't know that he trusted them all that much. And that was definitely the low point, I think, of cabinet relations, at least in his administration. Wow. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for tuning in. We got some great comments coming through uh, about the book and that people are reading the book. They're just finishing it. Uh, thank you for all that, Barry. Finished the book last fall. Uh, hoping to get a deeper dive into the cabinet in my government class this year. There you go, Barry. Oh, fantastic. Awesome. awesome. Thank you so much, Barry, for that comment. Uh, we have another Henry Knox fan. Jamie, there you go. You gotta love Henry. I mean, he, he was a bookseller. 
before. He was. I mean, how can how can history nerds not love right. Henry Knox? I feel right. like it's a requirement. And actually, I will give the audience a sneak peek. So I okay. currently have a dog, which a lot of people know about because I'm obsessed with my dog. Uh -huh. And his name is John Quincy Dog Adams, Quincy for short. And next year, we are thinking about getting him a little brother. And the brother will be Henry Dog Knox. Knox awesome. Sure. So uh, awesome. he is a much beloved historical figure in our house. Awesome. I, I, I'm, I approve of that one. <laughs> <Excellent>. <laughs> <laughs> I approve of that. And uh, John, thank you for this. I just ordered Dr. Fancy's book from Old Town Books in Alexandria. Oh, thank it's, you. That's one of my favorite bookstores. That's a fantastic bookstore. Shout out to them. Again, it's like the Henry Knox thing. We were all hung out in the bookstore together. Yes. And I mean, come on. That's why we got to love Knox. Um, Walt does ask, uh, touch on one of my guys, which is John Adams. Uh, thoughts on John Adams, Lindsay? Well, so I will say stay tuned for book two because oh. <laughs> John Adams is, uh, is getting some well-deserved attention. Nice. Um, so Washington never invited Adams to a single cabinet meeting. And um, unfortunately, he didn't say why. So we don't know, but I have, there are sort of two theories out there and I will tell you which one I think is more likely. So one theory is that as vice president, Adams was president of the Senate. And at that time, that was a very, wasn't an active role, but he was there every day. The Senate was in session. They were, he was expected to be present. And so it's possible that Washington felt like including him in cabinet meetings would be an inappropriate, mm -hmm. um, blurring of the separation of powers. Mm -hmm. I do not find that compelling at all because he had no problem talking about executive branch matters with Chief Justice John Jay. So I think the more likely scenario is that he just didn't really trust Adams all that much. Mm -hmm. They had a very respectful relationship. They regularly socialized with one another, but Adams had been a little critical of Washington during the war and Adams was a little resentful of Washington's sort of fame and you know stature. <laughs> And he had, Adams had a very early on in the presidency advocated for a very ostentatious title for the president. Oh, right. I think it was something like his highness and protect, elected protector of liberties. It's totally ridiculous. Doesn't really roll off the tongue. And I think that um, that really damaged his political reputation and harmed his sort of political currency. And so Washington just kind of wanted to keep him at arm's length. Hmm. Yeah, I remember reading about that where he's trying to come up with these large titles and, you know, like you say, the protectorate of et cetera, et cetera. And it's like, uh, yeah, that's not going to work <laughs> too well. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, you can kind of understand where, where you know, um, where he's coming from because he had served, you know, in every, basically every major court in Europe. And so he had seen what diplomacy looked like in those places. And he was really worried that diplomats that were used to Versailles and the court of St. James mm -hmm. were going to come to the United States and be like, what is this dinky little, you know, backcountry town with no pomp and circumstance. And mm -hmm. so he wanted some pomp and circumstance, um, but that didn't, that didn't go over very well. <laughs> That's true. So I have to ask while you were researching and, 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 preparing to write and maybe while you were, were, were writing and still bringing things together. What was the biggest surprise for you personally when you were doing this work? Uh, the, the document you might have been surprised to find or something that just opened your eyes to something new that you never thought of? Well, um, I think the biggest find for me, the biggest surprise was a document that is at Mount Vernon. Um, I, I didn't discover it. I just dis I, I discovered that it existed there um, for, for me personally. Um, it is in the fall of 1789, after the end of the first congressional session, Washington ordered a copy of the Constitution and all of the acts passed by the first Congress printed and bound in a beautiful leather volume. He also ordered a copy of that printed for the Chief Justice and all of the department secretaries. He then went and he picked it up in late fall, 1789. And... Um, it was in private hands until 2012 when Mount Vernon purchased it for $10 million. And um, it has a series of notations that Washington put in the margins. And I believe that he put those margin notes in January 1790 because he had a new volume printed every year after the end of Congress. So within 
the next year, it would have been out of date. So there was sort of a very short window when it would have made sense to return to that volume. And I think he was doing it when he was putting together his first State of the Union. And here's why. Next to uh, the part where it says the president shall from time to time give an address on the State of the Union to Congress, he drew a bracket and he wrote required. Next to the part that says the president may request written advice from the department secretaries on matters pertaining to their departments and the president with the advice and consent of the Senate will, you know, make treaties and foreign appointments. He did a bracket and he said president powers. Now, why is that not required? And the other section is. And I think the reason is that he had already met with the Senate and tried to get their advice on foreign affairs and it had gone very badly. So these notations, these documents show in real time him grappling with what it means to govern and trying to figure out how to be president and what authority is available to him. And he didn't make notations lightly. He wasn't a scribbler like John Adams in his books. Um, And so these were very carefully thought out notations. And While people know of the document and they sometimes share pictures of these notations as like, isn't this so cool that he wrote in his books? Very few people had actually stopped to think about what the constitutional implications of those notations were. Mm. So that was something I wrote about and something that really blew my mind because it, you know, you cannot underestimate the, the intensity and the tension and the stress and what it meant to be trying to do this for the first time with no roadmap and a real conviction that any wrong step would end the nation because the Republic was already on its second chance. The Confederation Congress had already failed and most countries don't get a second chance. And so you can just kind of see the intense pressure in these notations of trying to figure it out. Wow, that's amazing. You're seeing it in real time as he's thinking yeah. it out. That's just it's the, it's the coolest document. Yeah. It's the most amazing source. Wow. That is incredible. That is incredible. Uh, so I, as, as everyone knows, I put a link in the comments. Please go get your copy of the cabinet. Uh, I know that some of you already have, so thank you for doing that. Uh, and there's more on the way from Lindsay, apparently. She teased what's upcoming. I can't wait to see what's next because this did come out right as we were going into lockdown and you didn't get a chance to go do your tour. So, you know, I did not, I've been, um, I think a lot of people are, are familiar with what the back of my room looks like. Um, I've been here for a very long time. Um, I am starting to do some in-person stuff, which is so fun, um, to be able to actually see people and, you know, tell if my jokes land, things like that. Um, it's really not to be staring at a black box. But yes, I am uh, very hopeful that the next go round will not overlap with a pandemic. Yeah, all of us are hoping that. We, we can't <laughs> wait to all be together again in some form or fashion, plugging books and doing live stream interviews and all that good stuff. But uh, I, I do want to thank you so much, Lindsay, for coming on this evening and, and spending time with, with my crowd here on my page and, and getting the word out about your book has been awesome. I've really you know, been fascinated with your work. I can't wait to see what's next. Thank you. Well, thank you again for having me. I really appreciate everyone and appreciate all of your support and uh, excited to share what's yet to come. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lindsay, again. And and thank you everyone for watching, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube. We really appreciate you being here. Please check out the links in the comment section. I will talk with you all very soon. Take care, everyone. Be safe.